This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. When a child is injured, the whole family suffers. Sometimes the events can be so overwhelming that they challenge the limits of our faith. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories that remind us nothing should be considered impossible on Rescue 911. We begin on July 1st, 1992 in Holland, Ohio, where Scott and Connie Yoder live in a large tract of land near many other members of their family. What a little grandma. Bikes, motorcycles, and racing, and cars. It's just all part of the life here that we all live. Five-year-old Wyatt was riding his ATV around the family compound that afternoon. He didn't want to stop playing. He was having fun. Begged if he could stay home with his Uncle Sam across the street. I just had a feeling to tell him goodbye, which was strange. We'd already said bye, but something was telling me don't leave him yet. And as I was going down the pasture, and that's when I seen the four-wheeler on its side. My God! Wyatt! Wyatt! I seen him laying down, his Wyatt. little leg laying beside Wyatt. him. Wyatt! Wyatt, it's Mama! I mean, it's, it's almost like a horror film. It's what you would see on a screen. It's not what you'd see on your child. When we continue, his eyes would roll in his head and he would pass out and then he'd come to and I thought it's going to be a miracle if he even lives. When five-year-old Wyatt Yoder was seriously injured while riding his all-terrain vehicle in front of his aunt's house, his mother Connie ran to call 911. A next-door neighbor, David Teachout, heard Connie's screams for help. I could see a body in the grass. And Connie was up on the balcony, and she was saying, he's dead, he's dead. He's Dad, alive. Put pressure on the leg. Wyatt, can you hear me? Let's just straighten this a little bit. I'm not sure what really went through my mind when I moved the leg, because I know that uh, you shouldn't do too much moving. My main thought was comfort for him. Sam Yoder, Wyatt's uncle, tried to slow the bleeding. His eyes would roll in his head, and he would pass out, and then he would come to. And I thought, it's going to be a miracle if he even lives. Rescue units with the Springfield Township Fire Department got to the scene within six minutes, including paramedic William Montre. It was our first day. We had just started the service, and it was opening day at the Big Top. Mama's here. It's okay. Time was of the essence in this child's care. The only thing really holding the leg was a portion of the muscle group and some skin. So it was one of those what we call a load and go. We don't want to be on the scene more than 10 minutes on a patient in condition. 
So we get this on, I'll go up to the truck and get a hold of the MCO and we'll change our med channel. All right. I was holding his little head and he said, Mama, my leg, my leg. He thought everybody was on his leg. He was asking everybody to please get off my leg. And he said, Mama, am I going to die? You ready to go up on the couch? I said, Lord, no, you're not going to die, Wyatt. You're not going to die. But you're going to be fine. Let's go. I got his leg. But it's hard to tell him he's going to be okay when you don't know. You know, I'm going to go up the truck and get an eye. All right, run away. We'd all pretty much made our mind up that we'll do the best we can. And we'll deliver him to the hospital and from there, hope. As soon as Wyatt and his mother arrived at the Medical College of Ohio, the boy was taken to be examined. There's nothing I could do but the separation. I was so afraid I was never going to see him again. My father-in-law came and um, he said, they can fix broken legs. Said, yeah, they can fix broken legs. I don't know if they can fix them, Dad. You got no pulses in the leg, blood pressure? Orthopedic surgeon Robert Bielski was one of the doctors treating Wyatt. You know, obviously our initial concern is how unstable he was in terms of how much blood he'd lost. Our second very important concern is whether or not this was a salvageable limb. A doctor came up to tell us that there was probably nothing that they could do for his leg. It was gone. Take a look at his leg now, and all we saw happened. Seeing it the way I did, I didn't think that there was anything they could do for the leg. I just wanted my son. Count of three, one, two, three, little Luckily, the two nerves were intact in the back of the knee, so there's a very high chance that he would get some return sensation and muscle function in his leg. He was in surgery for, I believe, six hours. I think it was 2.30 in the morning before we got to see him. And the first thing he said was, Mama, I want a fudge bar. I want to go home and I want to ride my bike. And it was hard because I never knew if he'd ever ride his bike again. Okay, I'm gonna be downstairs. During the surgery, Wyatt's father, Scott Yoder, joined his wife at the hospital. It was a long wait, but it was the most wonderful sight in my life to see, uh, see him rolling by us and taking him into intensive care. Wyatt has already had seven more operations to rebuild his leg. With more surgeries ahead, and he'll need physical therapy for a long time to come. He knew he was hurt, and he knew he had to work hard. He knew he had to cooperate. He learned a lot of patience, because he had to lay in that bed on his back for a long time. Didn't break his spirit at all. He was lucky that he did save his nerves, but also that nothing else really was hurt on him. And he was lucky that he was found, because obviously, the amount of blood he lost, he could have easily bled to death at the scene. I think that a valuable lesson that anyone should learn from this situation is that the all-terrain vehicles are not toys. I know people say, why would he be on that? Well, coming from our family, uh, what we've grown up to be, what we've done in the past for years, he, it wasn't out of the ordinary for him to be riding it. But in my heart now, if they can't pedal it or roll it, they don't have it. That's my new model. One year later, the rescuers who helped save Wyatt still check in on him. We uh, have to drive right by Wyatt's house to get fuel for our truck. And we stop in once in a while and see him, and we get quite regular reports, which is nice. You being careful now? Yeah. Well, I think there's several heroes. Jimmy and William and all his doctors that did what they did. It's our neighbor man, David Teachout. You know, I call him Wyatt's little guardian angel. I could never thank him enough for what they've done. Who can I? When I grew up, heroes were these huge figures of people that did extraordinary things, and I don't feel like I did anything that was that extraordinary. Someone needed help, and I helped him. There was just a lot of things that went together that day that fell into place. I think God was looking after all of us that day, and especially after Wyatt. I think it was more than luck. What's your biggest thing you've been doing? Playing. Yeah. <laughs> Next. Okay. Okay, do you have anything in there whatsoever to protect yourself with? No. 
all I could think of was keep her quiet, keep her hid. In 1989, Stephen and Carol Tokay said goodbye to the stress and crowds that came with living in a big city and moved to the peaceful countryside near Knoxville, Tennessee. In the few years they'd been living there, most days began the same way until the morning of December 30th, 1991. That morning, I got up at 7 o'clock. Carol goes to bed at 2 or 3 or 4 in the morning, so she gets up later. Love you. See you this evening. Yeah. I think there's a lot of crime everywhere you go, but we felt that being in more of a rural area, you wouldn't be subjected to it as much. broken my house. Okay, are you inside? Yes. Do you know this person? No, I, I didn't even check. I just ran in here and called. Okay, are they inside the house now? Yeah, I heard them. Okay, is it a male or a female? I don't know. Okay, you didn't see them? I ran into the bathroom and them. Knox County call processor Joyce Estes took the call. We get so many calls where someone thinks someone's breaking home and it turns out to be a pet or even a family member that's come in. Okay, what did what did you see, honey? I or didn't here? see anything. My door shut. I was sleeping. Uh huh. Okay. The door was busted in. Okay. When she said that they had busted the door in, I knew then we had a good call. Troy seventeen, Troy nineteen, possible ten CC seven in progress. Sheriff's deputy Terry Montgomery was closest to the scene, but he was eight miles away. It can be very frustrating if you have to travel from one side of your beat to the other. It's always in the back of your mind, you know, is somebody going to be hurt? Am I going to get there in time? Can I go out and see if I can see who it is? No, no, no. You stay right where you are, honey. I don't have a lock in this bathroom. Yeah. Oh, you don't? No. Okay. Okay. Do you have a lock on your bedroom? Is your bathroom right off your bedroom? Yeah. Let me go. Okay. I hear him in here. Okay, I'll lock the bedroom door. Okay, I'm going to stay on the line with you until officers pull up there, okay? Yeah. I hear him on the back door. Okay. No, they went out the back door. Okay. We weren't really aware of what we were dealing with. All I could think of was keep her quiet, keep her hid. Oh, Jesus, they're coming back in now. Okay, can you see, can you see the farmhouse from the Who street? Is Who is it? When she yelled all of a sudden, it scared me to death. Because I thought, they know she's in the house now. And will they come looking for her? Okay, and they're not saying they anything? Say nothing. Do you have any kind of weapons there or anything? No, I don't know. Okay. Good God. Okay, do you hear anything now? Yes, they're slamming the door. Good heaven. What's going on? Who is that? Trying to get in the bedroom door. Okay. Okay, stay on. Stay on here way? with me. Stay here. On the way? Yeah, they sure are, honey. We got several on the way. The worst that you think about in a situation like that is is somebody being taken hostage. Can you hear anything now? Is he still trying to get in the bedroom? Yeah. 
Okay. Okay, do you have anything in there whatsoever to protect yourself with? No. It's in my dress. He's in my bedroom. He's going through the dresser drawers. I was more scared. The danger had escalated, and I didn't know how how bad it was going to get. Sweet Jesus. Okay. I know. You're, you're doing great, honey. Just, 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 you're doing great. Charlie 17, Charlie 19, complaint says that she's locked herself in the bathroom. The suspects are supposed to be going through the bedroom. When they broadcast that, the suspects were in the bedroom. The first thing I thought was, they're going to do something to this woman. They're not going to leave any witnesses. Try to stay real quiet, so uh, maybe if he hadn't heard you yet, he won't. He must have heard me. I yelled, who is it? He must know I'm here. Or can you still hear anything? Yes, yeah, he's going through stuff. Yeah, he yeah. I was looking for the number on the mailbox, and I was there before I realized it. I was in full view of anybody that would happen to have been looking out the window. The suspects were still in the house. Oh, man. Oh, okay. I know it. God. Yeah, they're, they're, they're coming, say, so same time. Oh, God. I hear him getting in a car. Okay, you hear him getting into something? Yes, in a vehicle. Okay, see if you can see what kind it is. Oh, there's a cop car. Oh, it is a cop. There's a cop car. Okay, okay. Oh, thank God. He's still there. I'm in the, I'm, in the, I'm in the bedroom right here. I'm in the bathroom right here. He's telling him to get out. Okay. I'm going to get down on the floor. Charlie 19, suspects are still in the house. Oh, Get your hands up! He must be running. All right. Running. Okay, someone is running. Yeah. On foot, up the road! Okay, he's in foot pursuit of him. Yes, he's about to catch him. Yeah. Okay, all right. Oh, God. All I could think about was running until my heart busted. I said stop or I'll shoot! I said stop! I was determined to catch at least one. Don't move! The officer had the suspect in custody. It was just such a relief. <laughs> can I cry now? Okay, you sure can, honey. Oh. <laughs> then okay. go to the restroom while you're in there. <laughs> I, I would like to. I just... <laughs> <laughs> oh. She was okay, and it was really all over. And we just started laughing. <laughs> and that's kind of unusual on a call like that. That's a heck of a way to wake up, isn't it? Oh, jeez, Louise. <laughs> when I saw the officer, he looked like a knight in shining armor. I was still shaken. Okay. Got it. And I went up there, and he put his arm around me, and he gave me a hug. And I started to cry. And it meant so much to me that he was there. She just hugged me up and just squeezed me and starts calling me her hero. That was the best part of it. <laughs> it's why you do the job. That's what makes it worthwhile. Where are we going to start? Well, I think I want to put those listeners in the front here. Okay. The little guys in front here. What's okay. the For two weeks after the incident, my hands would shake at odd times. It was the most terrifying thing I've ever gone through. But you do develop an attitude that when situations come up, 
that you have it within yourself to take care of it. And I think a lot of people don't know that it's there in them, but it is. Lost the color. You realize that it could have unfolded a lot differently, a lot, a lot worse. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Deputy Montgomery, I really can't uh, thank him anymore. There's, there's nothing, no words can do it. When the guys kicked in the door, I felt really alone. But as soon as I made that contact with that operator on the phone, it was like she was right there with me. To know that people are trying their hardest to help you, it's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. That's why I sleep at night. After the second suspect turned himself in, both men pleaded guilty to aggravated burglary. Since the incident, the Tokays have installed better locks and gotten a watchdog named Rocky. <laughs> oh, we love this you crazy dog. I love this place so much, I just decided I wasn't going to let him ruin it for me. It's a good old house. It's got good history. One little problem. I'm not going to sweat it. Sticky muddy, spitty. Go ahead. Spitty. <laughs> Ready? Get, 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 get. Yay! Next. It screams all the time. And I try to tell him that screaming is only when you're hurt. And I was like, no, oh, this kid's going to get it. Oh, my God, Bubba. Despite our best efforts to try and keep our children safe, there are times when kids get into trouble because they insist on doing things their own way. On March 24th, 1993, Robbie Kurth was at home in Hamlet, Indiana, looking after her three-month-old daughter, and five-year-old son, Bubba. Okay, we'll see you later. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you later. Come back Bubba's and see us. Bubba's very friendly. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bubba, you come back in the house now, okay? We've got to wave to everybody. He's a daddy's boy. He wants to be in the tools. Baba, what are you doing? I told you to stay out of those tools. Those are daddy's tools. He's got a temper, and he's he's a typical ornery, spoiled, rotten little brat. People would say, but he has a heart too. So for a boy, that's that's good. I was talking on the telephone. My daughter was in a crib, and I was arguing with some people about a paint job. I, I want to straighten that out before I make any more bills, okay? All right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, no problem. Okay, just, just get back to touch with me, okay? All right, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Susie, what you doing? Yeah, I know, I'm just fighting with people about bills. Yeah, I better go and check on him, okay? He all screams right. all the time. Bye. And I try to tell him that screaming is only when you're hurt. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Come here, Bubba. And I was like, no, oh, this kid's going to get it. He won't even come to me when I holler at him. Bubba, what are you doing? Oh, my God, Bubba. Come here, can you breathe? Robbie called her husband, Sandy, at work to tell him what had happened. Hey, LNG. With the weight of the toolbox in excess of a thousand pounds, I pictured the worst that it had tipped over and just totally crushed him. 911, place fire medical. Yeah, I live at East US 6. And my toolbox fell over on my son. I'm Support County 911 dispatcher Kathy Crash took the call. He was calm about it, but yet I could hear that fear in his voice, and he just says, I, I can't get there. 
Seaford Union first responders report base code four child. I took the chance of dialing the number and hoping I'd catch the mother. Seaford Union medic one will be in the ground. Hello. Hi, ma'am. This is 911. We've yeah. got a I knew from the first time she said hello, I needed to stay in the line with her. Can you get out yeah, the I can go back out there. I gotta take my daughter though. Okay, just and is the toolbox still on him? Yeah. Where's the? It's in the garage. Okay, but where's the toolbox? On I couldn't see any of his I body. A minivan in. I was it's scared that he was gonna die on me. I was gonna lose my son. And and the the van pinned him under. I mean, he's leaned against the van. Are he's you breathing? Against... Uh, can you breathe? Okay. Ask him, is he conscious? Yes. Okay, just keep talking to him. Keep him calling. I don't want you to move him, okay? Okay. She had to feel hopeless. And all I could do was assure her and keep her calm so she wouldn't take that chance of trying to lift that toolbox herself. Okay, can you breathe now? Don't go to sleep. No, baby, just try to keep him going. Honey, look keep at Mama. Stay him. there, Mama, come over there. He wasn't talking to me, and I, you know, I couldn't tell if he was okay. Uh, we've got everybody coming. We got first responders. We got a police officer coming and the ambulance, ma'am. Okay. I know. Come on, you got to stay with me, okay? I'm I don't want you in the garage so they can see. Okay. All My right. biggest concern at that point was to to bring her back down, but make sure she's listening to me and not paying so much of what her child is suffering. You know what I mean? I just I didn't want to lose connection with her. I can't touch No, ma'am, I, I don't want you to move, okay? You can't move them because they don't know what injury. You just let the fire department that help you, okay? 911, Bubba. They're right there. I hear them. Okay. You hear them coming? Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Ma ma you've got to stay calm, okay? Yeah. Just stay calm. They'll get there. There they come. Okay. Just calm down. It's all right. They'll help you. Okay, I'm going to hang up, okay? I was very relieved. Uh -huh. I knew, finally, someone was there to help her. Within seven minutes of the call, volunteer rescuers arrived on the scene, including firefighter EMT Spencer Walker. How in the heck did you get trapped under a toolbox? We had no idea what to think. And I saw it, and I just, I couldn't believe it. What's your name? What's your name? Bubba? No, hold, hold, hold first instinct was for everybody to just grab all the toolbox and, and jerk it off but we you know, you know time out uh, you know there might be some injuries here we don't know about he's a foot and a half off the ground we, if, if his legs broke or something we don't want him to just fall and crash to the floor okay, move your legs forward, okay, how about the other one? I can see you can move his hands and feet that's okay let's go ahead and set it up He comes over to me and he says, you know, I'm cold. I'm going to go in the house. LaPorte County Paramedic Jeff Rose assessed Bubba's condition. He was still very shook up. Wasn't quite sure what happened to him yet. Took his blood pressure, pulse, respirations, and listened to his lung sounds. It was amazing that there was no injuries at all. It could have been as long as 10 minutes. I was trying to get up so my mom wouldn't know. I thought she would get mad at me because I climbed on it and I scratched the van. If it wasn't for that van, he wouldn't be around to talk about it. The toolbox could have crushed his chest, so crushed his skull, could have had some spine injuries, could have been paralyzed. I would say miracle, but I think it's more like dumb luck. I didn't think they were going to get there on time. And they told us they would stay on me forever. <laughs> I think of all the things that, that he's going to do in his life and we're going to do together. And the thought of not having that, yeah, that's devastating. The same day as the accident, the Kurths took Bubba to their family physician. Even the doctor said, I've seen other cases of, you know, heavy toolboxes falling on people and stuff, and, you know, I don't want to go in details with your son being here, but he is very lucky. Go, buddy, shoot, shoot. As for a lesson, I bolted the toolbox to the wall. Now I realize that there's a lot more dangers in your garage than you think. 
He's a wonderful kid. Six years of our life. I couldn't imagine life without him. When a child reaches this condition, a high percentage of them will not make it through the next day. Get a little worse. Marlene Pacheco and her husband Manuel lived in Colorado Springs, Colorado, with their three children. As parents, they would do anything to make their kids happy. But as Marlene and Manuel discovered, sometimes the life of a loved one may depend on the actions and kindness of a long chain of strangers. Aaron, we always knew he was special from the beginning. And it was something about Aaron. He was playful, loving. So I, I never thought I'd ever have to experience anything like this. It was a Friday evening, and uh, I happened to notice he had a real big bruise right on his cheek. I thought that maybe one of the children might have hit him with the ball or swinging back and forth on the swing set. What were you guys doing outside? And, uh, they both didn't know. They both just, they didn't know how I got there. Oh, my God. That Monday morning, when I had lifted him from his rib cage, he had both my handprints on his ribs. Come here. Aaron was very weak. He had marks on his face from where I kissed him. That's how sensitive his skin was. You couldn't even press on him, and a bruise would occur. I was scared. There's no way of describing it. I felt like he was dying in my arms. Aaron's parents rushed their young son to Memorial Hospital, where he was examined by pediatric blood specialist, Dr. Emma Harwood. Sorry to have to tell you, but Aaron is very critically ill. I thought that he probably had a disease or a process going on that was interfering with blood production. And when a child reaches this condition, a high percentage of them will not make it through the next day. So I thought he could die within the next few hours for sure. He's bleeding from his nose and his mouth. He just looks like he's starting to get a little worse. All right. After seeing the initial blood test, I went back to the parents at that point and I told them that Aaron's bone marrow had failed. The possibilities as to why this had happened included leukemia, some severe diseases like aplastic anemia and severe infections and we should pray for leukemia. So he's done some significant bleeding. My husband and I, <laughs> no way am I gonna pray for leukemia because leukemia to me was something very, very serious and very scary. And aplastic anemia, that sounds harmless. And to tell you the truth, there was probably times when I prayed for aplastic anemia, which was very hard later when I found out that's what he had. Now that's a very serious problem. Aplastic anemia is a condition where the bone marrow production of blood totally fails. It was what I did not want to see. It was the diagnosis I did not want to make. And I felt very sad. The whole world stopped. I was sitting here looking at a situation that I couldn't understand. We had never experienced having anybody in our family die. Death at that point wasn't a reality. And so we were still very hopeful. The only thing I wanted to do was to go in and be with Aaron. Just about the only hope for victims of aplastic anemia is a bone marrow transplant. But the donor must be a perfect match. About one in four are lucky enough to have a relative, specifically a brother or sister, who will be a bone marrow donor for them. Of those unlucky children who do not have a donor within the family, the majority of them will die. Aaron's family, including his brother and sister Antoinette, volunteered to be tested. All I really knew is that he needed bone marrow transplant to live. In order to live, he needed that. And so if I had it, I'd give it to him in order for him to live. Unfortunately, when those tests came back, there was no donor within his family that matched him. The problem was to try to keep Aaron alive long enough with blood transfusions and medication until they could find a donor for him. There was nobody giving us any promises, any guarantees. We didn't know how long we had with Aaron. We felt very helpless. How was school today? 
fine. We have homework again. Dr. Harwood, she said that we got to get used to the fact that we're going to be here in the hospital for a long time. I knew then that we had a fight on our head. I wasn't going to let Aaron die. I wasn't going to accept the fact that he was going to die. They began a search of the National Marrow Donor Registry for a match for Aaron. But his family also contacted recruitment specialist Carol Carlson of the Colorado Marrow Donor Program. Her four-year-old son, David, had been a victim of leukemia. People ask me all the time, is David's death the reason that I do the work that I do? And no, it's not. David may be indeed the reason for the passion with which I do the work I do. I knew what it was like to sit and rock your child, not knowing whether he would be alive two days from then. Aaron's best chance for a donor match would be with someone who was also of Hispanic descent. His chances of finding a match were extremely small because of the 500,000 people that were in the registry in 1991, less than 3% of those were Hispanic. Hi, everybody. Oh, that Carol approached us and said, now, we'd like to go to the media to ask the public to come forward for this little boy. I have a press release that needs to go out today. Aaron is an absolute doll, and we knew with his picture and the realization that this is a real live little boy that is not going to survive if we don't find a donor, if we don't motivate people to action. He simply will not live. With the first wave of publicity, more than 700 people turned out to be tested and registered. I did not want another child to die. It became a personal mission almost, that Aaron was going to find a donor. Over the next four months, six other donor drives were held, and 3,000 new donors were recruited. We knew the chances of a donor coming from one of our drives was going to be a very slim possibility. I remember it was school, work, and then straight to the hospital. There was no in between. We hardly even lived in that house anymore. But Aaron was still with us. And there was so much love in that room. I mean, you can cut it with a knife. OK, we'll see you tomorrow. We spent Halloween. We spent Thanksgiving. We seen Christmas come around. And we spent New Year's. And the holidays were going. And people's lives were going ahead. And, and we were still in that room waiting. Good night. I bought Marnie the card. It was a Valentine's card, and she says, oh, she says, there's another holiday we're going through, spending in the hospital. That's pretty, huh? Good morning, folks. How'd you like some good news for a change? Finally, the news came back that, yes, the donor was willing, and it was a go. Send Aaron tomorrow. I can't believe it. The chills went up and down my spine. At the same time, I had that little bit of hesitancy Aaron now was going to enter a new phase of risk, but at least he had his chance. Everybody walked down, doctors, nurses, everybody was down in the emergency area to see us off. So it was really hard, and I think everybody was really happy, but at the same time, everybody was very afraid because they knew we were just beginning. Aaron and his parents were flown to the University of Nebraska Medical Center to begin treatments to prepare him for the transplant. She said that chemotherapy and radiation was gonna really, really take a heavy toll on Aaron. We were gonna have to go do what Dr. Harwood said we would have to do. And that was go and, and watch Aaron die all over again. We went into the room. I'm, I'll never forget this because I remember going to the window and looking out. And right outside the window, was a cemetery. I saw that cemetery and it was like something trying to tell me that you ain't one yet. Aaron was treated under the supervision of pediatric bone marrow specialist, Dr. Bruce Gordon. Before you get the transplant, you need to do something to kill off your immune system so that the bone marrow that you're getting from someone else will engraft. So indeed, he did get, and we expected him to get very sick 
On March 5, 1992, the long-awaited bone marrow was donated at Presbyterian Hospital in Albuquerque, then flown 500 miles to Aaron. The donor had sent Aaron a bear. She sent a big white bear for Aaron. And um, whoever this donor was, was compassionate, very caring, very giving. And that was enough for us. The doctor came in with the bone marrow. He takes the packet of blood and tosses it to my husband. And my husband catches it, almost like wants to pass out. He's holding the bone marrow, and he's, he's looking at it. We're all, like, shocked. He tossed Aaron's bone marrow across the room. I warned you it would be anticlimactic. All I can remember is just sitting there thinking, gosh, I'm holding Aaron's life in my hand right here. This is what's going to save him. Uh, it was like me and Marlene just kind of took a deep breath, and we knew that it was just a waiting period now. The emotions in that room were incredible. This was the most moving experience I have ever shared. It was very moving to watch, not just Meryl going into Aaron, but a chance at life for an entire family. But every now and then rationality would kick in and I would think, Carol, he might not make it. He got pretty sick. And I remember when I went back to the Potter house where we were staying, I bawled so hard. Aaron didn't deserve it. And many times I kept saying, switch this, put me in his shoes. For the first two weeks, every day we'd go out and look at his charts and we'd see nothing. On day 12, I went out to look at the chart like I do every morning and there was one cell. I knew that the bone marrow was working. Two months after his transplant, Aaron and his parents were flown back to Memorial Hospital where he spent almost three weeks before he was finally released. That day that we left, it was like getting out of prison. We were prisoners of this illness. We all served a sentence and we got out. We got out, we were free again. Recently, the Pacheco family got a chance to meet the donor who gave Aaron the gift of life, Stella Egan. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Fine. What Stella Egan did for Aaron was probably one of the greatest things you could ever do for someone. <laughs> this is Hi. Antoinette. I knew nothing about Aaron. Absolutely nothing. Just that he was one and a half years old. But, oh, I'm just happy that I could help him. Somebody said that giving marrow comes from the hip, but really, my, mine came from my heart. Well, my, my part was very small, and it was, didn't hurt at all. To her, it was so little to give, but for us, on the other end, I mean, Erin wouldn't be with us today. Every time we look at Erin, she's with us. People that you don't even know come out. I hold Stella dear to my heart. Each and every one of us are on this earth for a reason. And her reason was to save Aaron's life. On May 22, 1993, Aaron's family celebrated his third birthday, one they never thought he'd see. His family paid special tribute to all those who helped save their son. When you share an experience like this with another human being, it's a feeling, a bond that will never go away. I think we're joined at the heart. Stella, would you please come up? Ooh, they keep on telling me what a wonderful person I am and all this, but really I don't feel any different. I just, I just wanted to help somebody else. It's so overwhelming, and I just want to say that our hopes and our prayers have been answered just by looking at Aaron today. Thank you. I like winning against these diseases. The important thing that we need people to know is that there is a tremendous need for all of us to join the National Registry. The process is incredibly simple and very, very safe. But what you're giving to another individual is 
a chance at life. Is that good? Every year, approximately 16,000 men, women, and children search for bone marrow donors. Seven out of 10 will not find a match in time to survive. You can help change those grim odds by volunteering to the National Marrow Donor Registry to become a donor. This series is dedicated to all the caring people who are committed to saving lives. I'm William Shatner. Join us again next week for more true stories on Rescue 911. Step out of the car, please.